Many people with MS are doing well with limited disability even after years or decades of disease, but others are progressing, getting gradually worse. Perhaps they can't walk as far as they used to, they're clumsier, maybe don't feel as cognitively sharp. It could be subtle but add up over time and become very significant even if MRI scans are stable and show no new lesions. But why? What is the cause? I don't know. But in this video, I'll share six theories of potential causes of progressive MS and how they could be treated. Number one, damage from the innate immune system. We know that MS inflammation is primarily initiated by the adaptive immune system, the B and T cells, the cells that learn and change over time and recognize very specific antigens or targets of myelin or foreign viruses and bacteria. However, there's evidence that in progressive MS, the cells that you're born with, the macrophages, the microglia, that do not change and learn, that you're born with may set up shop, perhaps secondary to injury from the adaptive immune system and cause a slow smoldering inflammation. I have a whole separate video on smoldering MS, link in the notes below. We may be able to see this on specialized MRI scans. This is an MRI from a man in his late 50s who actually has relapsing MS, though there's evidence of progression even in people who have relapsing MS. And we see a dark rim around a lesion, a paramagnetic rim lesion, which can actually slowly expand in some cases on subsequent MRI scans, but it's very difficult to see on conventional sequences, and this has been corresponded on autopsy studies with smoldering inflammation. This is a study with a specialized PET scan which marks activity of the innate immune system, the macrophages and microglia, and you can see secondary progressive MS, the top row, relapsing remitting MS in the middle, and healthy controls at the bottom, and there's the most activity in secondary progressive MS, an intermediate amount of activity of the innate immune system in relapsing MS and almost none in healthy controls. And even people on highly effective disease modifying therapies still have evidence of activation of the innate immune system, suggesting that in some cases we may be missing the target. We see the same thing on autopsy studies. This is a sample from someone with inactive progressive MS. We used to think that inactive MS, the inflammation was gone, the fire has burned out, and the trees are falling down, but that may not be true. We can see the microglia are still present in the specialized stain, causing the smoldering inflammation. So if the innate immune system theory is true, we have to use new drugs that target the innate immune system and not the lymphocytes, but the good news is there are some drugs that do this in ongoing clinical trials, such as the Bruton's tyrosine kinase inhibitors, tolibrutinib and phenobrutinib, currently in phase three trials. We'll see how they perform in real life. Number two, B cell follicles in the meninges. We think of MS as a central nervous system disease, affecting the brain, the spinal cord, and the optic nerve. But on pathological studies, in some people with progressive MS, there's an interesting finding outside of the brain in the meninges, the coverings of the brain. This is a CD20 stain marking B lymphocytes, the cells that make antibodies, and there can be a ton of them, these gigantic B cell follicles in the meninges, again, outside of the brain. But what do they do? Because they're very prevalent in progressive MS relative to relapsing MS, it suggests they have something to do with the pathogenesis, but it's really unknown. I even reached out to Dr. Pavan Bhargava, who's an expert in this particular topic, and he said it's unknown. Some theories involve the creation of autoreactive antibodies that could target myelin or releasing cytokines or cell signaling molecules that create a more inflammatory milieu within the central nervous system. But could we kill these cells? and cause a benefit. Of note, drugs that target CD20, such as Ocrevus, Casimta, Rituximab, Briumbi, they don't really get into the meninges or the cerebrospinal fluid very well. There's one small preliminary trial on intrathecal rituximab, giving rituximab directly into the cerebrospinal fluid, but it was heretofore unsuccessful. Could there be another drug given in a different way, perhaps through an Omaya reservoir or with really good central nervous system penetration, some new drug. 
I don't know, it remains to be seen. Number three, mitochondrial failure. You may have heard of the book Minding My Mitochondria by Dr. Terry Walls, where she hypothesizes that changes in the function of the mitochondria may influence multiple sclerosis. The mitochondria are little organelles or mini organs within the cell involved in energy production, and there's evidence of derangement in multiple sclerosis. For instance, there can be more mitochondrial DNA mutations and defective repair of abnormal genes. The mitochondria actually have their own non-chromosomal DNA. There can also be changes in expression of those genes and changes in enzyme activity and resultant metabolic failure. Furthermore, certain genetic mitochondrial diseases can actually mimic the clinical symptoms and MRI findings of MS. For instance, these MRI scans are from a 61-year-old woman who had painless vision loss in the left eye in her 20s and later a second episode of vision loss in her right eye and then decades later slurred speech. And even though these lesions look highly typical of MS with periventricular lesions, an optic nerve lesion on the left, a posterior spinal cord lesions, she she actually has something else, a genetic disease, Leber's hereditary optic neuropathy plus syndrome, also known as Harding's disease. The red flags in the history are that she had very severe but painless vision loss. Optic neuritis in MS is typically painful. Also, usually people with MS don't have very severe vision loss in both eyes, though it can happen, and her brother has the exact same condition because it's genetic. But anyway, people can be fooled and and this is very real. I actually have two patients with this exact condition, and it suggests that there's something similar between the pathophysiology of certain mitochondrial diseases and multiple sclerosis. So if the mitochondrial theory is true, Dr. Walls could be right. Nutrition could be very important, or certain supplements that affect the function of the mitochondria, such as coenzyme Q10, or certain pharmaceuticals that affect mitochondrial function, such as abutilast. Number four, oxidative injury. Closely related to the function of the mitochondria and metabolism is the idea of oxidative damage in the cell. In chemistry, oxidation is just taking away electrons. In organic chemistry, it's adding oxygen to carbon chains, and we're carbon-based organisms, and a lot of carbon-based organic molecules can be injured through oxidation. Animal models of MS, which are somewhat different from humans with MS but have important similarities, show evidence of oxidative tissue injury. The myelin, the fat the sheath of the nerve fibers in people with MS can reveal oxidized phospholipids. Autopsy studies show evidence of reactive oxygen species and nitrous oxide within the plaques, and there can be other changes in the tissues, such as acidification of the extracellular space and increased oxygen consumption. Also, many of the antioxidant enzymes, such as superoxide dismutase and glutathione peroxidase, can be impaired in MS. And perhaps there are certain nutritional principles or nutritional supplements or pharmaceuticals that could target this process. Number five, ongoing Epstein-Barr virus infection. You probably know that EBV, the cause of mono, is linked to MS, and virtually 100% of adults with MS test positive for antibodies against EBV, indicating prior infection. Now, it could be that EBV is involved in the initiation of MS and ongoing infection is insignificant, but some people believe the virus plays an active, ongoing role even within the nervous system. For instance, EBV can infect B lymphocytes and immortalize them, make them immune to T cell regulation, so they're not regulated and target self antigens. Remember the meningeal B cell follicles I mentioned earlier? They can actually be infected with EBV. And in brain autopsies of people with MS, the B cells and the plasma cells, which derive from B cells, can be infected with EBV. For instance, this is a special stain for Epstein-Barr virus messenger RNA within the meningeal B cell follicles. And this suggests there's active Epstein-Barr virus replication because it's actually producing mRNA, which is then translated into proteins, which 
create new viral particles. And you may say, maybe this is nonspecific, but they also did similar stains in autopsies of people with other conditions like central nervous system vasculitis, viral encephalitis, and fungal meningitis, and they didn't find the same thing. We also see EBV in the brain of people with MS. This is an autopsy study, and this is a chronic active MS lesion, and they did staining for EBNA2, one of the Epstein-Barr virus proteins, and it's definitely abundant. So if the EBV theory is true, instead of targeting the immune system, we should be targeting the virus. And people have tried ATA-188, an immunotherapeutic against EBV, was unsuccessful. In my opinion, a lot of the trials on small molecules that have antiviral properties against EBV haven't been too impressive, but maybe someone will come up with something new. Number six, normal aging. Okay, hear me out. I'll give an analogy with the disease polio. So polio is a viral infection that normally causes a gastrointestinal illness, but about one in 400 people get poliomyelitis, in other words, infection of the motor neurons leading to weakness. They may have some paralysis, but improve and be stable for the rest of their life. However, many decades later, 30, 40, even 50 years later, they may show up in my office with progressive weakness in the muscles previously affected by polio. And on examination, they have evidence of a progressive lower motor neuron disease. This is known as post-polio syndrome. But no one really knows why anyone gets it. People have tried everything. They've tried immunosuppressants, thinking it's an inflammatory disease. They don't seem to work. They've tried other things. And no one really knows what's causing it. But one theory is it's just normal aging. And the idea is that when you get poliomyelitis, you lose a lot of your motor neurons. And then those remaining motor neurons can sprout axons and innervate a lot of the muscle tissue so you can recover and not lose too much muscle strength. But later in life, just with normal aging, you lose some of your motor neurons, but you no longer have a reserve of motor neurons, so you're not able to compensate for it, and this leads to progressive weakness. Whereas someone who didn't have polio, they can lose 20, 30% of their motor neurons with normal aging, and they won't notice a difference because they have a significant motor neuron reserve. Maybe something similar is happening in multiple sclerosis. You could have an injury to the central nervous system early in the disease, but because you're young and healthy, you can compensate for it well, but just with normal aging, with some tissue loss that occurs in everyone and changes in the cell that occur in everyone, you're no longer able to compensate for the injury. And it could be not one thing, but hundreds or even thousands of things. Accumulation of mutations in mitochondrial DNA, accumulation of oxidative injury, neuron loss, whatever it might be, and it just causes progressive multiple sclerosis, and that may be why it's so variable from person to person, because aging is so variable from person to person. Now, this may sound like the most pessimistic of all of my theories, but it depends on your perspective. Perhaps aging can be slowed by changes in lifestyle, diet, exercise, stress management, or slowed by novel pharmaceuticals, or even stopped if you believe in certain advances in future technologies. So what do you think? When I first started trading, the mitochondrial failure theory was most prevalent, and now people increasingly recognize the importance of the innate immune system in MS. Could it be that multiple of these factors are occurring simultaneously, or is there something else that I left off the list entirely? And let me know if you have any ideas for other videos.